Hi Founder fans, Jason here. Welcome to our first live read-along. Hi TJ, thank you for showing up first to our first live read-along. Uh, I am about 10 seconds ahead of you guys, but that's okay. We're going to try something new today, and I hope it becomes a reoccurring thing. I think it might be a lot of fun. We can learn together all in a lot of different ways. Uh, what we're going to do is read along together. Uh, there are a wide variety of documents and correspondence from the American Revolution that we can learn from together and uh hopefully in the future you guys can even recommend things you might want you might want me to look at uh today we're going to start i could have started anywhere we're going to start with william pierce's uh sketches of the characters of the american revolution let me let me say this again uh character sketches of delegates to the federal convention uh william pierce was a delegate to the constitutional convention and he uh he was there briefly but he wrote a sketch what he called a sketch he wrote a little bit about each person who was there it's one of the few primary resources from the early days of the constitutional convention where we can learn about the people who are actually there so i thought this would be a very fun place to start uh eventually we'll go back i was thinking about maybe going through the the federal farmer letters not uh federal farm the letters from a pennsylvania farmer uh things of that nature course it's telling me my stream is a bit low if we're having any problems please let me know uh i shouldn't because i'm just doing this uh william pierce does not end up signing the united states constitution he's only at the convention for a few months before he goes back to new york city because he's still a delegate to the continental congress so he ends up going back to new york city uh ostensibly to take care of his merchant business and work uh in the continental congress but actually because he had a duel to fight in uh the gentleman who he fought against that name escapes me right now I should have it pulled up, but I don't. But I do know the person he fought a duel against. Uh, his That person's second was Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and Hamilton actually intervenes as a second, is able to resolve the issues before the duel is fought. But Pierce does not return to the Continental Congress. Uh, I'm sorry, to the Constitutional Convention. So the document we're about to read is actually his only contribution to, not to United States history. He actually fought in the war and was an aide-de-camp to, I forget who he was first in aide de camp for, but he ends up being an aide de camp to Nathaniel Green when Green kind of wins the war in the South. So uh, this will be fun. Anyone popping in? This is the first time we're doing this. We're going to do a little read along. Uh, these are, again, anyone who's just getting in here, these are William Pierce's notes about the different people at the Constitutional Convention. So why don't we pop over here? Here we go. Oh, oh in the description, there is a link to this if you want to read along. That's kind of the point of a read along. Uh, the link is, I'm, I'm using right now uh, a website called Teaching American History, uh, dot org, I believe. Yeah, Teaching American History dot org. It's a really fascinating website. There's just a ton of primary resources. So we're going to plow through. Let's take a look. And here are the character sketches of delegates to the Federal Convention from William Pierce. So he starts uh, the way Constitutional Convention usually started in the North. Uh, he starts with New Hampshire. First, uh, uh, John, J-N-O, was a, how they used to abbreviate John, actually, even though you're only taking out one letter and you're mixing them backwards. Don't know why they used to do that, uh, but they did. So John Langdon Esquire and Nicholas Gilman Esquire. What's interesting right off the bat is some people get very brief descriptions and some get really long ones. So, Mr. Langdon. Mr. Langdon is a man of considerable fortune, possesses a liberal mind and a good, plain understanding about 40 years old now this is about 13 years after john langdon was a member of the first continental congress uh he would go on to be governor of, i'm sorry langdon was a member of the second continental congress not the first uh, i always confuse him with john sullivan for some reason because they knew each other and were in the same place from new hampshire uh he a considerable fortune is the best way to put it <laughs> a very wealthy man uh, who, who participated through the war. He was in the Continental Congress on several occasions. Uh, one of the more important leaders of New Hampshire uh, was governor and would be governor again of New Hampshire by this time. Nicholas Gilman. Uh, Mr. Gilman is modest, genteel, and sensible. Nothing brilliant or striking in his character, but there is something respectable and worthy in the man, about 30 years old. It's interesting. 
Uh, and he's not uh, not the, the most fascinating character, but respectable. So he comes from the Gilman family. Uh, he would later be in the United States Senate while his brother was governor. Uh, the American history... Uh, uh, what is it? The American Revolution History Museum in, in New Hampshire is actually in his house, the Gilman house. Uh, so they are, are quietly a really important early family from Massachusetts, although not that quietly. Gilman signs the Constitution, uh, and, and I meant New Hampshire. Um, and those are the only two people from there. Uh, he then moves on to Massachusetts. Uh, Rufus King, Nathaniel Gorham, Jerry, and John Caleb Strong Esquire. So Caleb's entered here. Uh, it seems that he got his name wrong. <laughs> um, he thought Mr. Strong was Caleb Strong. Mr. Strong was John Strong. I'm sorry, reverse that. He thought his name was John, his name was Caleb. Uh, some of these are really big names. First of all, Mr. King. Mr. King is a man much distinguished for his eloquence and great parliamentary talents. He was educated in Massachusetts and is said to have a good classical as well as legal knowledge. He has served for three years in Congress of the United States with great and deserved applause and is at this time high in the confidence and approbation of his countrymen. This gentleman is about 33 years of age, about 5 feet 10 inches high, well-formed and a handsome face, with a strong expressive eye and a sweet high-toned voice. In his public speaking, there is something particularly strong and rich in his expression, clear and convincing in his arguments, rapid and irresistible at times in his eloquence, but he is not always equal. In his action, he, uh, his action is natural, swimming, and graceful, but there is a rudeness of manner sometimes accompanying it. But take him toot ensemble, he may with propriety be ranked among the luminaries of the present age. So, first of all, you'll notice that New Hampshire was much shorter, and Massachusetts is a lot longer when he describes these people. Uh, that's probably because Massachusetts was very important at the time. New Hampshire, they, all the states were, of course, important, but New Hampshire, not quite so much. Um, uh... Now, I should also note, I have read these in the past, and I read the first, I read some of them ahead of time, but most of them I didn't read ahead of time because I wanted my reaction to be more natural while we discuss it. So, for example, I don't know what he means at the end here. Take him toot ensemble. <laughs> um, uh, I, yeah, it seems, uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm not even going to guess. Uh, Rufus King would go on to be a vice president. Um, no, he would not be vice president. He would run for president of the United States. He would be one of the last Federalists to run for president, uh, I believe, against James Monroe. Uh, and he would also be just really important uh, throughout. I, I have a bad tendency to confuse him with Elbridge Ger Gary. Uh, their lives overlap quite a bit. Um, so I am blanking a little bit on what King does. But as you can see here, he is giving King a whole lot of credit for a 33-year-old kid who is at the Constitutional Convention. Um, that being said, uh, he really seems to like his character. He is well-formed and graceful, pleasing to the eye, <laughs> really a whole lot of fun. And, and, and it's really interesting. He may with propriety be ranked among the luminaries of the present age. Just really acknowledging this guy, this is someone to be reckoned with. And he would be, he would be an inaugural, I believe, Senator, uh, um, although King would move to New York. It's funny, he's representing Massachusetts at the Constitutional Convention. Two years later, he'd represent New York in the uh, Congress. Uh, he then moves on to Mr. Gorham. And I'll remind you, we spoke about Mr. Gorham earlier this week. Well, actually, we're going to talk about him tomorrow in the live wrap-up. But we spoke about him. I, I did a video on him uh, just the other day. Gorham, at the convention, by the time this is being written, which, again, uh, Pierce, who wrote this, leaves in early June. So, uh, at the time this is being written... Gorham has basically just been elected as chairman of the Committee of the Whole. He is overseeing more debates in the Constitutional Convention than George Washington is by now, which is nothing to snuff at. So let's see what William Pierce uh, has to say about him. William Pierce, by the way, I, I believe grew up in Virginia, but a resident of Georgia at this time. Oh, too far. Mr. Gorham is a merchant in Boston, high in reputation and much esteemed of his countrymen. He is a man of very good sense, but not much improved in his education. He is eloquent and easy in public debate, but has nothing fashionable or elegant in his style. All he aims at is to convince, and where he fails, it never is from his 
auditory nor understanding of him. For no man is more perspicuous and full. He has been president of Congress and three years a member of that body. Mr. Gorman is about 46 years of age, rather lusty, and has an agreeable and pleasant manner. Now, I presume lusty has a different meaning today than it did at the time. Um, but he, uh, again, is doesn't quite is not quite as infatuated with Mr. Gorham as he was with Mr. King. But uh, Gorham is a, uh, as he says, uh, he's not the most eloquent pub public speaker. And we'll notice, William Pierce is very attached to men who can speak publicly very well. It's very important at the Constitutional Convention to be able to convey your opinions accordingly. Uh, now, Gorham is not a great orator. He doesn't convince with sweeping language, but as he says here, uh, he makes it very clear how he feels. He's not the smartest guy in the room. He's not the best speaker, but this is what's going on. He lays it out very clearly. Now, we're moving on to another man from uh, Massachusetts, Mr. Gary. I don't think it's pronounced Jerry, though gerrymandering is named after this gentleman, though he was not really happy with the gerrymandering when he was later governor of Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. Gary would be one of the luminaries of the Revolutionary Era, especially the founding generation. This is a man who signed the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he's now at the Constitutional Convention. He's one of three people who is there when it's signed and stands in the room and says, no thanks, I won't sign that. Uh, then he goes on to be Vice President of the United States under... Uh, um, uh, uh, James Madison. Uh, he also uh, is one of the part of the XYZ affair in France when they're trying to bribe the Americans. So Mr. Jerry is a really fascinating character. And anyone just popped in, we are doing our first read along. We're reading through William Pierce's character sketches of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention. So Mr. Gary, Mr. Gary's character is marked for integrity and perseverance. He is hesitating and laborious speaker possesses a great deal of confidence and goes extensively into all subjects that he speaks on without respect to elegance or flow of diction. He is connected and sometimes clear in his arguments, conceives well, and cherishes as his first virtue a love for his country. Mr. Gary is very much a gentleman in his principles and manners. He has been engaged in the mercantile line and is a man of property. He is about 37 years old. It seems that uh, uh, Pierce never bothered to ask anyone exactly how old they were. He just kind of guessed. Um, again, Gary is a, a, a giant in the revolution. He's top 20 most important founders easily. Uh, although apparently he's not a great speaker. Uh, he is He's not a great speaker, but he's very confident. And he'll just talk about it. And he'll he'll ramble on and lose his train of thought, but he just keeps going and going. Uh, he's sometimes clear in his arguments, and he thinks well. Uh, he, so, like, he is thinking things through. It just seems from reading this that he's kind of thinking it out loud in front of the Constitutional Convention, which is a great place to be thinking of. Now, uh, uh, Caleb Strong's not someone I remember a ton of, so I can't really comment too much. He doesn't get a whole lot of lines here either. Um... Mr. Strong is a lawyer of some eminence. He has received a liberal education and good connections to recommend him. As a speaker, he is feeble and without confidence. This gentleman is about 35 years of age and greatly esteemed by his colleagues. Uh, so the word liberals come up a few times and we, uh, we use the word liberal significantly differently today than we did back then. They often use it uh, before he said a liberal mind. Now they say a liberal education. Uh, they mean uh, you, you well research a liberal education means he know he's been he, he has been educated in a wide variety of subjects essentially uh, he's not just a lawyer or a merchant he is a liberal education it means you usually would have gone to school in Europe for a liberal education at this time and that's Massachusetts next we move to Rhode Island but Rhode Island didn't show up at the Constitutional Convention they didn't like what was going on so we move on to Connecticut Sorry, Rhode Island. From Connecticut, we have Samuel Johnson, although uh, I believe his name is William Samuel Johnson, but he seems to have gone by Samuel Moore, Roger Sherman, and Oliver Ellsworth Esquires. Again, he, uh, for some reason, put W. He must not know his first name. At the time, they used last names. They would refer to each other directly as Mr. Strong, Mr. whatever, Mr. this, or a doctor, like Dr. Johnson. I'm going to take a quick sip. 
He goes to town on this. Now, a uh, side note on, on William Samuel Johnson. He had been all over the country. Uh, uh, all, he's mostly remained in Connecticut, but he was one of the people, I believe, he may have got, don't quote me on this, but I believe he went to uh, Ben Franklin's 1754 uh, Albany Conference where they first talked about uniting before the French and Indian War. So he's been around forever. He's actually, at this point, accepted to represent Vermont. He is a Connecticut representative in the Continental Congress and now here at the Constitutional Convention, but Vermont has contacted him and asked him to represent them because they're technically an independent nation right now, just trying desperately to become a state. Uh, and Johnson has sympathy for them. So he is, in essence, representing them, no unofficially. Dr. Johnson is a character much celebrated for his legal knowledge. He is said to be one of the first classics in America and certainly possesses a very strong and enlightened understanding. And I love that line. He is said to be one of the first classics, like one of the original Americans, which makes sense. Again, I'm like 90% sure he was at the, the Ben Franklin thing. Ben Franklin is really the first American, the first classic, right? He's one of the first classics. So let's continue with him. As an orator, in my opinion, there is nothing in him that warrants the high reputation which he is for public speaking. There is something in the tone of his voice not pleasing to the ear, but it, he is eloquent and clear, always abounding with information and instruction. He was once employed as an agent for the state of Connecticut to state her claims to certain landed territory before the British House of Commons. This office he discharged with so much dignity and made such an ingenious display of his powers that he laid the foundation of a reputation which will probably last much longer than his own life. Dr. Johnson is about 60 years of age, possesses the manners of a gentleman, and engages the hearts of men by the sweetness of his temper and that affectionate style of address with which he accosts his acquaintance. Beautiful. So he is... Maybe not the best speaker, but he's sweet. He's he's genuine, and and people like him. People fall in love with this man, uh, just because of how genuine he is. Uh, they he mentions in there something that Johnson basically became famous for before the revolution. He went to Britain on several occasions. One of which was to argue against the taxation policies that that would eventually lead to revolution. Uh, but here he mentions specifically he goes to represent Connecticut and landed claims in the West. It's interesting because uh, Connecticut on a map today, it goes up to New York and stops. Uh, and that always happened. But according to Connecticut, after that, it started again after New York and went all the way to the Pacific Ocean. This would actually lead to uh, some quasi wars that broke out with against Pennsylvania before, during, and after the American Revolution in what is now the Wyoming Valley, basically northern Pennsylvania. Connecticut said, no, that's part of ours. Uh, and that's why parts of Ohio, like Marietta, Ohio, some of the first territories in Ohio, Cleveland, were settled by people from Connecticut because Connecticut claimed the rights to these lands. Um, and that's it for William Samuel Johnson. He then goes on to Mr. Sherman, Roger Sherman. Who would sign the Constitution is the only person to sign all four major documents of the American Revolution. Now, Sherman, as I believe he mentions here, uh, came from humble beginnings. Most of the men at the Constitutional Convention came from families of some wealth. Sherman did not. He worked his way up. Bootstraps. He's also the second oldest guy after Benjamin Franklin at the Constitutional Convention. He's also the guy who I think would speak third most at the convention. So let's talk about Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman exhibits the oddest shaped character I ever remember to have met with. He is awkward, unmeaning, and unaccountably strange in his manner. But in his train of thinking, there is something regular, deep, and comprehensive. Yet the oddity of his address, the vulgarisms that accompany his public speaking, and that strange New England cant which runs through his public as well as private speaking, make everything that is connected with him grotesque and laughable. And yet he deserves infinite praise. No man has a better heart or a clearer head. If he cannot embellish, he can furnish thoughts that are wise and useful. He is an able politician and extremely artful in accomplishing any particular object. It is remarkable that he seldom fails. I am told he sits on the bench in Connecticut and is very correct in the discharge of his judicial functions. 
in the early part of his life, he was a shoemaker. But despising the lowness of his condition, he turned almanac maker and so progressed upward to a judge. He has been several years a member of Congress and discharged the duties of his office with honor and credit to himself and advantage to the state he represented. He's about 60 years old. So that is one of the most amazing tributes I've ever heard one founder give another founder. I mean, no man has a better heart or a clearer head. What more could you say about a person? And he takes the time here. Again, New Hampshire, he gave each person one sentence. He takes the time here to go through Roger Sherman's life and, and really recount that he was dissatisfied with being a shoemaker and made his way up to being a judge and eventually was put uh, made his way to the uh, uh, assembly and was sent the First Continental Congress, the Second Continental Congress. He signed the Declaration. He signs the Articles of Confederation. He reads the Constitutional Convention. He would shortly, along with Dr. Johnson we just spoke about, be one of the architects of the Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise. Now, this isn't necessarily so great historically because it is the one that uh, gave the Senate full representation. It, it essentially, I, I guess I shouldn't say that. It, it, it gave the Senate equal representation and it gave the House of Representatives representation based on population. And the reason I say it's not so great is because later the three-fifths clause, clause comes along and we all know how unfair that was. Um, but I really love this tribute uh, to him. Um, Mr. Ellsworth. Mr. Ellsworth of Connecticut. Uh, uh, Oliver Ellsworth is also another really large guy. Not only does he help here, uh, he ends up becoming a um, a member of the United States Senate, and he's the one working with Madison and the House of Representatives to get the Bill of Rights accomplished a few years down the line. Um, I don't think he signed the Declaration. I'm not sure. I, I don't believe he did. Uh, but he goes on to be the third Chief Justice of the United States. So, pretty important dude. Uh, Mr. Ellsworth is a judge of the Supreme Court in Connecticut. He is a gentleman of a clear, deep, and copious understanding eloquent and connected in public debate and always attentive to his duties he is a very hap uh, he is very happy in a reply and choice in selecting such parts of his adversary's arguments as he finds mark the strongest impressions in order to take force of them so as to admit the power of his own mr ellsworth is 37 years of age a man much respected for his integrity and venerable venerated in his abilities so it's really fascinating. Uh, again, he's focusing on oratory in a lot of these, which, first of all, he met most of these men for the first time here, and he heard them speak in front of the, the con Constitutional Convention. So this is what he would know best. Uh, but they're debating the United States Constitution. So what he says here, uh, choice in selecting such parts of his adversary's arguments as he finds makes the strongest impression. They would speak one at a time, sometimes for hours. So instead of going on and picking every little part apart, what he's saying here is Ellsworth, which is spelled with two L's, by the way, he got it wrong here. Uh, Ellsworth would listen to an argument and the best part of someone's argument that he disagreed with, he would go forward and reply to the hardest part, essentially argue against the hardest thing to argue against which apparently made um, a mark. 37 years of age, if you noticed, almost everyone's in their 30s here. <laughs> almost everyone is younger than I am. Uh, now, from New York, Alexander Hamilton, Robert Yates, and John Lansing. Again, he gets it wrong with a W. I don't know why. <laughs> Let's see what he has to say about Alexander Hamilton. Colonel Hamilton is deservedly celebrated for his talents. He is a practitioner of the law and reputed to be a finished scholar. To clear, to, uh, I'm sorry, to a clear and strong judgment, he unites the ornaments of fancy, and whilst he is able, convincing, and engaging in his eloquence, the heart and head sympathize in approving him. Yet there is something too feeble in his voice to be equal to the strains of oratory. It is of my opinion that he is rather a convincing speaker than a blazing orator. Colonel Hamilton requires time to think. He inquires into every part of a subject with the searchings of philosophy, 
And when he comes forward, he comes highly charged with interesting matter. There is no skimming over the surface of a subject with him. He must sink to the bottom to what he sees. I'm sorry. He must sink to the bottom to see what foundation it rests on. His language is not always equal, sometimes didactic, like boiling brokes at others light and tripping like sterns. His eloquence is not so diffusive as to trifle with the senses, but he rambles just enough to strike and keep up the attention. He's about 33 years old, of small stature and lean. His manners are tinctured with stiffness and sometimes with a degree of vanity that is highly disagreeable. Alexander Hamilton, vanity that is highly disagreeable. What could sum up Colonel Hamilton better? Now, uh, he really seems to not like Hamilton, but like his brain. Uh, he, he really goes into detail about how... Uh, what I really find interesting about this is not only that he's saying... Hamilton is goes down to the foundation of any problem. He doesn't just talk about the, the the overtones. He goes deep. This is the heart of what we're talking about. Let's peel it apart. But uh, he rambles on enough to keep your attention. So it seems that Hamilton will talk, and he'll talk, and he'll talk, and then he'll like start thinking out loud for a bit. But he, he's good at thinking out loud, so he can keep you with paying attention while he's thinking out loud, and then he'll get back on track and keep going. It's a really fascinating way uh, of Alexander Hamilton's oratory. And he did speak. Uh, Hamilton didn't, was one of the most speakers, but there was one day at the Constitutional Convention, they mentioned this in the, in the Broadway musical, he gets up and speaks all day. He speaks for eight hours. All day. Alexander Ham talking. Now, during this conversation, we don't we don't have great notes about the Constitutional Convention. We have Madison's notes. We should have William Jackson's notes, but he was a terrible secretary. But what we do know is that it certainly seems like Hamilton was up there for eight hours talking about how great monarchy is. And while he didn't necessarily outright say, we need a king, he basically said, we need to be almost exactly like Great Britain. Maybe we have our king not inherit his lifetime appointment. Um, uh, which is fun. Mr. Yates. Now, these next two gentlemen, Mr. Liang, Mr. Yates and Mr. Lansing, would leave the Constitutional Convention, go back to New York, tell Governor Clinton what was going on, and become some of the most prominent anti-federalists fighting against the Constitution. Uh, Governor George Clinton of New York would join them, and then Melanchthon Smith would join them. And, and I've been doing every Friday the Federal Farmer Papers, uh, Federal Farmers Anti-Federalist Papers, that was probably Melanchthon Smith, uh, though there, it's also, we went through Brutus a few months ago, Brutus may have been Robert Yates, so <laughs> we're not sure, most people would probably acknowledge it was Yates, so let's look at these guys. Mr. Yates is said to be an able judge. He is a man of great legal abilities, but not distinguished as an orator. Some of his enemies say he is an anti-federal man, but I discovered no such disposition in him. He is about 45 years old and enjoys a great share of health. Whammy. Notice the phrase anti-federal man. It's funny, he says, I discovered no such disposition in him. He would be. Uh, Pierce was wrong. <laughs> he is certainly an anti-federal man. Uh, that being said, uh... 45 years old, someone in their 40s. Look at that. Um, and now Mr. Lansing. Uh, and John Lansing was actually a student of Yates. Yates taught him the law, essentially. So it's very interesting that they're the two sent by New York with Hamilton to come here. Mr. Lansing is a practicing attorney at Albany and mayor of that corporation. He is... He has a his hesitation in his speech. I think he means hesitation. Okay. Uh, let's try this again. And uh, real quick, uh, when it says mayor of that corporation, he means mayor of Albany. Lansing was sitting mayor of Albany when he was at the Constitutional Convention. And I'll remind you, Albany was a lot more then than it was now when it comes to cities in America. Mr. Lansing is a practicing attorney at Albany and mayor of that corporation. He has a hesitation in his, in his speech that will prevent his being an orator of any eminence. 
His legal knowledge, I am told, is not extensive, nor his education a good one. He is, however, a man of good sense, plain in his manners, and sincere in his friendships. About 32 years of age. Not a ringing endorsement for Yates and Lansing. All right, now New Jersey. William Livingston, David Brearley, William Patterson, and Jonathan Dayton. We've spoken about a few of these guys recently. Brearley, we're going to talk about tomorrow in our live video. Uh, he was the chairman of the Committee of Postponed Parks. So at the end of the Constitutional Convention, all the stuff no one could figure out, they threw on his shoulders. Uh, William Livingston voted for independence a decade before this, but left before signing the Declaration. And the entire time, had been governor of New Jersey the entire time. Just like Clinton was governor of New York the entire time, Livingston was governor the entire time. Uh, Patterson becomes an opponent of the Constitution, uh, helps put together fights for the small states, uh, and Jonathan Dane becomes the youngest signer of the Declaration. We talked about him a few weeks ago. So, Governor Livingston is confessedly a man of the first rate of talents, but he appears to me rather to indulge a sportiveness of wit than a strength of thinking. He is, however, equal to anything, from the extensiveness of his education and genius. His writings teem with satire and a neatness of style, but he is no orator and seems little acquainted with the guiles of policy. He is about 60 years old and remarkably healthy. Well, look at that. Good for you, Governor Wilson, uh, Governor Livingston. Uh, by the way, his daughter, Sarah, is uh, John Jay's wife, and his uh, son, Henry Beekman Livingston, would go on to be a justice of the United States Supreme Court. So uh, he's also with the Livingston family, who just... So many Livingstons. <laughs> uh, remarkably healthy. That's fun. Uh, this is fun, too, that uh, uh, the sportiveness of wit over the strength of his thinking. Uh, he's not the best thinker, not the smartest guy, but he is clever and funny. Mr. Brearley is a, is a man of good rather than brilliant parts. He is a judge of the new of the Supreme Court of New Jersey and is very much in the esteem of the people. As an or, orator, he has little to boast of, but as a man, he has every virtue to recommend him. Mr. Brearley is about 40 years of age. Not a lot going on there. Again, Brearley would be important at the end of the convention. Patterson. Mr. Patterson is one of those kinds of men whose powers break in upon you and create wonder and astonishment. He's a man of great modesty, with looks that bespoke talents of no great extent, but he is a classic, a lawyer, and an orator, and of a disposition so favorable to his advancement that everyone seems ready to exalt him with their praises. He is very happy in the choice of time and manner engaging in debate, and never speaks when he understands his subject well. This gentleman is about 34 years of age, of a very low stature. Wow. Uh, I'm not sure what that means at the end there. Let's see. Um, he's a man of great modesty. His, pa his powers break and create wonder. So he can really bring things to life. Um, he's happy with the choice of manner of engaging in debate, but and never speaks when he understands his subject well. He never speaks when he understands it well. So that must mean that when he gets up to speak at the debates, he gets up there and says, so let me get this straight. <laughs> like, he doesn't go up there and say, this is what we should do. He goes up there, like, let's just clear this up real quick. <laughs> okay, thanks, Mr. Patterson. Captain Dayton. Captain Dayton is a young gentleman of talents with ambition to exert them. He possesses a good education and some reading, he speaks well and seems desirous of improving himself in oratory. There is an impetuous impetuosity in his temper that is injur, injur wow, fun. Let's try this again. There is an impetuosity in his temper that is injurious to him, but there is an honest rectitude about him that makes him valuable member of society and secures him the esteem of all good men. He's about 30 years old, served with me as a brother aide to General Sullivan in the Western Expedition of 79. So he's referencing at the end there, the Sullivan Expedition, uh, which went across upstate New York, uh, 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 routing out the Iroquois Nation. Which is interesting because, oh, that's right. I mentioned earlier, William Pierce, who wrote this, was a, an aide de camp to General Sullivan. So him and Dayton were both aides de camp to General Sullivan at the same time. So... Uh, I mentioned earlier, most of these people he was meeting for the first time. No, these men fought a war together. 
Uh, so very interesting. Uh, it's it seemed to be it's interesting because that's probably why he's saying there's a lot of potential in this kid. Uh, it says he's about 30, 30 years of age. When this was written, he was 26. <laughs> um, the youngest guy there. Uh, so it's like, okay, I fought with this kid. I like this kid. He's not great at this constitution writing thing yet, but he has a lot of potential. All right. From Pennsylvania. All right. There's a bunch of people from Pennsylvania here. We have Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Mifflin, Robert Morris, George Clymer, Thomas Fitzsimmons, Jared Ingersoll, James Wilson, Governor Morris. Uh, let's get through Pennsylvania. I, we might, maybe we might call it quits. This is a little bit longer document than I thought it was going to be when I started. So maybe we'll get through Pennsylvania and finish the rest up. Uh, maybe tomorrow. Who knows? Uh, it's fun here. If you're having fun, uh, there's only one of you watching. It might just be you, TJ. So if you like what we're doing here, uh, let me know. I'm going to figure out a way to get this little thing on the side here off. I want to get rid of that. I'll figure it out. Dr. Franklin. What does he have to say about Benny Franks? Dr. Franklin is well known to be the greatest philosopher of the present age. All the operations of nature he seems to understand. The very heavens obey him, and the clouds yield up their lightning to be imprisoned in his rod. But what claim he has to the politician, posterity must determine. It is certain that he does not shine much in public council. He is no speaker, nor does he seem to let politics engage his attention. He is, however, a most extraordinary man. He tells a story in a style more engaging than anything I've ever heard. Let his biographer finish his character. He is 82 years old and possesses an activity of mind equal to a youth of 25 years of age. This is a man meeting his hero. William Pierce, like almost everyone else in the room, like George Washington, like John Adams, like Thomas Jefferson, like any founding parent you can name. William Pierce also grew up reading Poor Richard's Almanac. He, ben Franklin was a celebrity in the colonies before there was a celebrity, and then when we went international and started this revolution, he became a celebrity in the other worlds also. Uh, this is a man just, the very heavens obey him. Oh yeah, not only did he grow up reading Poor Richard's Almanac, he, like, Ben Franklin invented the lightning rod, which is why the rest of the world loved him. Because churches used to get struck by lightning because they were the tallest buildings in town. Now that didn't happen anymore. He, he, <laughs> like, he solved the 20,000-year-old problem of getting struck by lightning. Uh, he's no speaker, nor does he seem to let politics engage his attention. But don't we know historically now, as he says, let his biographers finish it? He's had plenty of biographers, and we realize now not letting politics engage him was his political expertise. Uh, it was earning people's trust. I'm not going to say anymore because obviously we could talk about Ben Franklin for decades. General Mifflin. General Mifflin is well known for the activity of his mind and the brilliancy of his parts. He is well informed and a graceful speaker. This general is about 40 years of age and a very handsome man. Good for you, Thomas Mifflin. Not a lot here. Mifflin had been uh, uh, in the... Uh, uh, Major General in the Continental Army. He was kind of loosely associated with the Conway Cabal, which hurt his reputation for a bit. But he goes on to become uh, 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 President of the Continental Congress. He's the one who accepted George Washington's resignation as General of the Army. Uh, a really important guy. And still just about 40 years old and, and super cute, apparently. <laughs> just saying. Uh, Robert Morris. Uh, Robert Morris, at this point... The only when when they started the Continental Congress, George Washington was elected president right away. The only other person who was considered for the position was Robert Morris, and in fact, Robert Morris nominated George Washington for the position to avoid any issues or conflicts. Morris had essentially paid for the war himself. He did have friends who helped, uh, you know, Governor, Governor Morris, Hiram Solomon. There were people who were involved, uh, but Robert Morris essentially paid out of his pocket for the Revolutionary War. Uh, he was Minister of Finance and Minister of the Marine for most of the 1780s. Uh, ext an extraordinarily important person. I, I, impossible to underrate. Robert Morris is a merchant of great eminence and wealth. Yeah, uh, An able financier and a worthy patriot. He has an understanding equal to any public object and possesses an energy of mind that few men can boast of. Although he is not learned, he yet... 
Although he is not learned, yet he is as great as those who are. I am told that when he speaks in the Assembly of Pennsylvania, that he bears down all before him. What could have been his reason for not speaking in the convention, I know not. But he never once spoke at any point. This gentleman is about 50 years old. Now that's fascinating. Again, uh, William Pierce, who wrote this, leaves in June. He's got a duel to fight in New York, so he leaves. Uh, I, I think Morris did speak on at least one occasion, but he's similar to George Washington and similar to Ben Franklin, neither of whom really spoke all that often in the Constitutional Convention. Their presence is what mattered. Their presence alone gave weight to this discussion. Uh, Mr. Clymer. Mr. Clymer is a lawyer of some abilities. He is a respectable man and much esteemed. Mr. Clymer is about 40 years old. George Clymer doesn't get a whole lot of attention here. Uh, I am blanking a little bit on some of Clymer's past, but he was also a pretty important American founder. Uh, he might have signed the Declaration, too. I forget. I forget. <laughs> Mr. Fitzsimmons is a merchant of considerable talents and speaks very well, I am told, in the legislature of Pennsylvania. He is about 40 years old. Now, Thomas Fitzsimmons was Catholic, and he would sign the Constitution. He was the only Catholic to sign the United States Constitution. Uh, Catholicism was slowly becoming more acceptable in the United States. Uh, for anyone who's just popped in, we are reading the sketches uh, drawn, written up by William Pierce, who briefly attended the Constitutional Convention. And we'll find out what he thought about the people who went to the Constitutional Convention. Then we talk about Mr. Ingersoll. <clears throat> Let me see my water real quick. Because now I'm not just talking, I'm reading and talking. It's a lot. There's a lot going on here. Mr. Ingersoll, supposed to have two L's in his name, is a very able attorney and possesses a clear legal understanding. He is well educated in the classics and a man of very extensive reading. Mr. Ingersoll speaks well and com comprehends his subjects fully. There is a modesty in his character that keeps him back. He's about 36 years old. So he's letting yet another guy in his, in his 30s. Uh, there's a modesty in his character that keeps him back. That's very interesting. Uh, um, speak your mind, son. <laughs> Mr. Wilton. Now, Wilton did sign the United States, uh, the Declaration of Independence, and would sign this document. This is James Wilson, uh, a really important legal mind. Uh, arguably, the arguably the most developed uh, the smartest legal mind in the country and he would go on to be on the united states supreme court shortly after this mr wilton ranks among the foremost in legal and political knowledge he has joined to a fine genius all that can set him off and show him to advantage he is well acquainted with man and understands all the passions that influence him government seems to have been his peculiar study all the polit all the political institutions of the world he knows in detail and can trace the causes and effects of every revolution from the earliest stages of Grecan Commonwealth down to the present time. No man is more clear, copious, and comprehensive than Mr. Wilson, yet he's no great orator. He draws attention not by the charm of his eloquence, but by the force of his reasoning. He's about 45 years old. High words. Uh, similar kind of to, to Hamilton a little bit, and so, some of the other people. Uh, 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 Roger Sherman with his, uh, how did he say, grotesque manners. Uh, Wilson is just unbearably smart. And he's able, he might not be the best speaker, but he knows what he's talking about. And everyone there realizes it, including Pierce. Obviously, this is a man who, when we talk about government, we should pay attention to his studies. Governor Morris. Interesting that he says Mr. Governor Morris because, well, there's two people named Morris representing Pennsylvania. Unrelated, Governor Morris is actually from New York. He signs the he signed the Articles of Confederation representing New York. Here he is representing Pennsylvania. Uh, he's from the Morris family of New York. They had a declaration signer in that family, important family. Uh, Morris, Governor Morris, uh, is not related to Robert Morris, though he was Robert Morris's number two. Uh, when funding the war, especially the second half of it. Governor Morris also would write the final draft of the Constitution. Uh, it is the, um, he's the one who chose the words, we the people. So. Mr. Governor Morris is one of those geniuses in whom every species of talents combine to render him 
conspicuous and flourishing in public debate. He winds through all the mazes of rhetoric and throws around him such a glare that he charms, captivates, and leads away the senses of all who hear him. With an infinite with an infinite stretch of fancy, he brings to view things when he is engaged and deep in argumentation that render all the labor of reasoning easy and pleasing. But with all these powers, he is fickle and inconsistent, never pursuing one train of thinking, nor ever regular. He has gone through a very extensive course of reading and is acquainted with all the sciences. No man has more wit, nor can anyone engage the attention more than Mr. Morris. He was bred to the law, but I am told he disliked the profession and turned merchant. He is engaged in some great mercantile matters with his namesake, Mr. Robert Morris. This gentleman is about 38 years old, and he has been unfortunate in losing one of his legs and getting all the flesh taken off his right arm by a scald when a youth. Okay, whammy. So he gets a little bit wrong. He's not really a namesake of Robert Morris. That's a common misconception. At the end, he mentions he lost a leg. Uh, rumor had it that uh, uh, Robert Morris liked, uh, I'm sorry, Governor Morris liked to um, be, uh, uh, have, uh, I'm trying to figure out a polite way to say it. He used to have consensual relations with lots of women, many of whom were married. And the rumor had it that he jumped out of a window half naked when a husband came home and got hit by a carriage and lost his leg. That's not actually true. He actually had an unfortunate accident climbing into a carriage and the horses moved and he fell and got his leg caught in the spoke and was broken and then it was amputated. Uh, and he also mentions that he has a lot of the flesh on his right arm taken off because he was scalded by boiling water as a child. He would also go out, he would do a lot of things. He would actually end up going to France to replace Thomas Jefferson when the French Revolution breaks out as minister to France. Uh, a good friend of George Washington, um... Years later, he would actually eventually get married, but he would have, uh, I don't even want to say this, uh, he would have kidney stones later in life, and he would use a sharpened whalebone that he would stick in his urethra to unclog the blockage, uh, and that got infected and killed him, so that's how he dies. Anyway, uh, Governor Moore is an extremely fun character. There's a book somewhere behind me, it's one of the books that actually got me into the American Revolution. Uh, by one of my favorite authors, Richard Brookheiser, uh, called um, uh, something, uh, 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 what's, uh, the, the Rake Who Wrote the Constitution. Something Gentleman, The Rake Who Wrote the Constitution. I can't believe I'm forgetting the name. It's one of my favorite books, but let's continue. We're at Delaware. So, um, tell you what, why don't we get through Delaware, uh, and then we'll call it a night for tonight, because uh, we're approaching an hour. And, uh, you know, we still got half the states to go, so we'll do that afterwards. i um, not sure when. I'm just going to start doing these live. If you guys like I hope you guys like this. I think this will be a lot of fun. Um, excuse me. This is a lot longer than most of the readings will probably do. I, I assume we'll go through letters. Uh, I have a link to the Discord channel in the description below. Uh, if you go over to the Discord and you have a letter you want me to read, send it in. We'll talk about it. Uh, we can choose a, two people and find a random letter between the two people. Uh, Governor Morris to Robert Morris, final letter. We'll read through it. We'll see what fun things we can pick out. Uh, or we can go back and just read through more popular documents. Uh, I hope this is something that takes together. We're really trying to figure out. I know the live audience uh, likes to chip in and, and likes me going live and having conversations so you can ask me questions. Uh, and I'm hoping... Uh, I've really thought about it a lot. And Although there's only two people hanging out now, uh, usually more people chime in for the live videos. So, hopefully we like it. Uh, let's go through it. John Dickinson, Gunning Bedford, Richard Bassett, and Jacob Broom, Esquire. So they're all lawyers. Delaware sends a bunch of lawyers. John Dickinson is one of the greats of the revolution. Really one of those big names that you need to know. Um, let's see what Pierce has to say about him. Mr. Dickinson has been famed through all America for his farmer's letters. Oh, side note. The farmer's letters were actually what I was thinking about starting with. So... I went with this because it's talking about founders. Uh, we'll do this, then we'll finish it up. Probably tomorrow. We have the live video tomorrow, but maybe after that we'll do it. Um, but I was actually thinking about starting this series here with uh, his farmer's letters from the 1760s, which sheds a lot of light on early complaints of the, to the revolution. Uh, anyway. 
Mr. Dickinson has been famed through all America for his farmer's letters. He is a scholar and said to be a man of very extensive information. When I saw him in the convention, I was induced to pay the greatest attention to him whenever he spoke. I had often heard that he was a great orator, but I found him an indifferent speaker. With an affected air of wisdom, he labors to produce a trifle. His language is irregular and incorrect. He flourishes, for sometimes attempts them. Oh, his flourishes, for he sometimes attempts them, are like an expiring flame. They just show themselves and go out. No trace of them are left on the mind to, to cheer or animate it. He is, however, a good writer and will ever be considered one of the most important characters in the United States. He is about 55 years old and was bred a Quaker. As you can see, uh, one of the handful of people that Pierce acknowledges, the, this is a luminary. This is a guy. Like He shall be remembered for his efforts. Uh, it's funny, his flourishes, I think by flourishes he means hand gestures. As you can see, I'm good at hand I do them all the time. I actually can't see that far down the screen. I do hand gestures all the time. I guess uh, when he attempts them, Dickinson would kind of... <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to mimic it. I could stare at myself and do that all day, but I'm not going to. Mr. Bedford, Gunning Bedford, great first name. Mr. Bedford was educated for the bar, and in his profession, I am told, has merit. He is a bold and nervous speaker and has a very commanding and striking manner, but he is warm and impe impetuous in his temper and precipitate in his judgment. Mr. Bedford is about 32 years old and very corpulent. How <laughs> you like that, TJ? <laughs> uh, so I like to think I'm good at vocabulary, but he uses a bunch of words here that I am not <laughs> entirely sure what he's going for. Uh, corpulent, that is beyond me. I don't know what precipitate in his judgment means. Uh, I don't know how you have a bold and nervous speaker. How can you be bold and nervous? So I'm going to skip right by that one. Mr. Reed, uh, uh, George Reed, uh, he might have signed the declaration also. Man, my memory's failing me on that front. Uh, but another big, smart law guy. <laughs> um, Mr. Reed is a lawyer and a judge. His legal abilities are said to be very great, but his powers of oratory are fatiguing and tiresome to the last degree. His voice is feeble and his articulation so bad that few can have patience to attend to him. He is a very good man and bears an amiable character with those who know him. Mr. Reed is about 50 years old, of a low stature and weak constitution. Uh, low stature means uh, he's not, he's like punched. Weak constitution means he's sickly, uh, as many were at the time. Mr. Bassett's his first name is eluding me. George William. Ah, oh. Mr. Bassett is a religious enthusiast, lately turned Methodist, and serves his country because it is the will of the people that he should do so. He's a man of plain sense and has modesty enough to hold his tongue. He's a gentlemanly man and in and is in high estimation among the Methodists. Mr. Bassett is about 36 years old. So, notice he's focused on the Methodists. I'm surprised for Fitzsimmons he doesn't focus on the Catholicism. Maybe he doesn't even want to bring it up. Uh, but for but he does focus on him becoming a Methodist. Uh, Methodism had been around, though it was a fairly new religion coming out of the First Great Awakening, which was about the time the Revolution started. Uh, the Methodists were more, uh, I'm not a religious student very much, so so I want to be careful how I say this. Uh, they were pacifists, not like Quakers. Uh, they were more closely uh, associated with other denominations of Christianity than the Quakers, but they were pacifists. And in fact, uh, oftentimes, uh, abolitionists. A lot of the early abolitionists came from the Methodist movement. And Methodism had many of the earliest black preachers in it. So, uh, interesting, he's a man of plain sense and modest and holds his tongue, that all makes a lot of sense. Mr. Broom, Jacob Broom, is a plain good man with some abilities, but nothing to render him conspicuous. He is silent in public, but cheerful and conversable in private. He's about 35 years old. Great. Thanks a lot, Mr. Broom. And with that, we are going to take a break. It's been about an hour. Uh, tomorrow we are going to do our live wrap-up, which is an hour. Maybe after that, 
depending on how we feel. Uh, we'll come back and finish this conversation. Uh, I'm going to pop back over here. Uh, you guys, TJ, you've been watching the whole time. A few people popping in, popping out. Let me know how you like this. Uh, do you like the setup? Can you read what's next to me? Um, I'm hoping you can. I did put a link, like I said, in the description to read along. Uh, if you go on the Discord, uh, I haven't yet. I'll probably add a new channel to talk about, you know, if you guys have recommendations or just anyone you want to know about, uh, letters, documents, anything of that nature. We'll read through it. Um, this is one of the easier places to start. We're going through brief descriptions of founders that are signers of the Constitution, so they're more well-known. Uh, so th I thought this would be an easy place to start, but if you want to dig di deep into some heavier documents, I was thinking about doing it with the Anti-Federalist Papers I read about, though that's tough because I, I do have to kind of concentrate so I can write an article after I'm done reading them. Uh, Oh, Ashley, great. I'm glad you can make it. I'm glad you think it's cool. I was hoping you guys would enjoy it. Uh, and I know I... Great. I will continue it, Ashley. Uh, like I said, over on the Discord channel, uh, if you have any recommendations, uh, probably tomorrow. I don't know. It depends how we feel after we do the weekly wrap-up. Uh, but if not, maybe I'll do it Friday before trivia. Uh, I had a few new ideas for trivia, too, which we'll talk uh, We'll talk about on Friday. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm really glad you like it. I like it, too, because... This way I get to do research and make the video instead of doing them separately. <laughs> it's actually very convenient. Uh, but yeah, and, and so, like I said, if you have like, oh, I want to learn about, you know, we could choose like maybe John Adams and one of his kids and read two or three letters between the two of them and learn about that relationship. Or Thomas Jefferson and, and William Short is a really important guy that... Uh, for international affairs that stayed it was Jefferson's secretary in Europe and stayed there when Jefferson came back to be secretary of state uh, there's just a bunch of people that uh, so if we want to learn about those relationships I love learning about the relationships between people so I'll be happy to do that or also like I mentioned documents like this or the the um, Pennsylvania farmer that John Dickinson wrote before the revolution that's the other thing I was thinking I can start with some documents from the stamp back crisis and move forward uh, or, or whatever so as long as we're reading about the revolution, we're learning stuff, then I'm having fun. So, uh, thank you guys. Uh, oh, uh, well, have a fun trip to California, TJ. I'm really glad you could pop in, too. Uh, I'm going to start doing them all the time, I think. So, watch for me to go live, because I'm not going to schedule them. I'm just, when I have the opportunity, these I'm going to look at when I have the opportunity, I'll do them. All right. So, uh, let me see. Pop myself back up. Oh, is that weird now, because I was on the other screen so long? Either way, uh, thank you so much, guys. I am going to go. I don't have a sign-off for these yet, but we'll come up with one. See you next time.